Good afternoon everyone. Welcome to TLC Academy. This is Alan Susi with you today, uh, Director of Nursing here at TLC. Uh, my presentation today is going to focus attention on something we encounter pretty regularly in our work as caregivers and that has to do with blood-borne pathogens. Um, this is an exercise uh, sometimes in futility if you will because uh, no matter how conscientious we might be about uh, taking care of ourselves, uh, we do encounter situations that expose us to all kinds of disease and uh, bacteria and other things. So, I hope by the end of the presentation you'll have some better sense of what is important for you to pay attention to. My goals today are to define what a pathogen actually is in the context of this conversation. I want to inform you about the OSHA regulations that concern blood-borne pathogens in the work setting. I would like to define how pathogens are transmitted, and I want to clarify the employer's role in educating you about uh, the prevention of infection for we employees. I want to define what universal precautions is, and then I want to emphasize the importance of, very importance, of proper hand washing. So, OSHA Bloodborne Pathogens Standard applies to all employees who can reasonably come in contact with human blood or some other infectious body fluid in the course of their jobs. Employers are compelled to review every job classification they have and make a determination of the potential occupational exposure for that particular position. TLC has done so. It is important for all employees to know if their job classification puts them at risk for occupational exposure. And some of that you all have been exposed to during orientation when you went through it here at TLC. Indeed, if your job classification does put you at risk, you are expected to be aware of the specific tasks or procedures that have the potential to expose you. An example might be changing someone's brief, or emptying someone's urine bag. There's two essential practices that an employee uses to eliminate or minimize the transmission of a blood-borne disease in the workplace, and in your own personal life, if you want to look at it that way. Work practice controls are used, and engineering controls are used. The practice controls are all about the tasks that you perform to minimize your exposure. Engineering controls are all about mechanical or environmental fixes that can take place. Practices that are completely prohibited in the workplace include these. Bending, recapping, and removing contaminated needles. Shearing or breaking a needle mouth pipetting or suctioning of potentially infectious material, and putting sharps materials directly in the trash. Some examples of environmental fixes that are commonly used are syringes that have protective shields surrounding the needle. So when you're done, you simply push it up and it protects you from getting stuck. Mm -hmm. Syringes with retractable needles. They, we have some lancets that we sometimes use for blood-borne pathogens and uh, I mean for uh, blood sugar testing and when you use them once the needle retracts itself back into the device and you can simply throw it in the trash because there's no danger of anyone getting stuck. Mm -hmm. A lancet uh, is used sometimes directly where you have a little device that you have to put the lancet in those tend to be a little bit more challenging for caregivers and, and clients to use yeah. because of the risk of getting your finger stuck mm -hmm. before you're supposed to. A device with a blunt tip is also not recommended and a device that has no needle or pressurized injection gun is sometimes used as an alternative to using injection and regular needles and syringes to inject medication. Um, I encountered those personally when I was in the military. Uh, they injected us, all of the vaccinations they gave us were with guns. Mm. Um, it's estimated that about 600,000 to 800,000 needle sticks occur annually. But many of these don't get reported. 
and they're not reported in a timely manner. The types of needles often associated with injuries are hypodermic needles, blood collection needles, needles used in IV delivery systems, and sutures, the needles they use for suturing. If you are exposed to a given pathogen, your first priority should be immediate self-care by flushing, allowing a puncture wound to bleed, and wash with soap and water as quickly as possible after exposure. There are several items that require special handling as regulated waste. They are liquid or semi-liquid blood or potentially infectious material, contaminated items that could release potentially infectious material in a liquid or semi-liquid state, items that are caked, either solid or dry, with potentially infectious material that are capable of releasing these materials during handling. Contaminated sharp objects, which would be the most common one we might encounter. Contaminated items should not be placed in normal garbage containers ever, unless they are contained within a hard, surfaced, secured container. These items should be marked specifically in a container lined with a special bag, usually red, or marked as a hazardous material. We have sharps containers in many of the facilities that we work in, or we have even some that are used in homes. Um, but to be frank with you, or a coffee can, a metal coffee can, or an old um, uh, dish, de or an old uh, laundry detergent container, uh, keeping the cover for it can also suffice because the plastic is hard enough to keep the, the items contained. And once they're deposited in those, those containers, they generally can't be taken out again. Um, the items should be contained in a specially marked container. And uh, when the sharps are, are put in a hard container, they have to have a permanently closed cover, which does not allow for access after depositing them in it. So, even though we may manage at home by using something like a contain detergent container, usually when those are thrown away in the trash, they are wrapped with some type of tape to keep the cover on so that it doesn't dislodge when it's in the, con in the trash container. In any event, contaminated items should be stored in a way that requires you to not reach into a container. <coughs> or have access to that container without having to reach into it. This necessary step may act as a reminder. Don't put your hand in there. Yeah. Whenever picking up contaminated broken glassware, you are not safe doing so simply wearing gloves. Rather, you should use tongs or similar tools and a broom and pan as preferred methods. When all else fails, you need to report immediately to a supervisor and provide as much detail about the exposure condition that you encountered as possible. Is it, it is at times necessary to acquire additional help when the client's welfare is also at stake beside your own. The assistant can help the client while you help yourself. This is the right and professional thing for you to do. I emphasize that it is not safe to reuse needles, transfer body fluids between containers, or to dispose of used needles in the trash. You can help protect yourself from needle stick injuries by avoiding the use of needles where safe and effective alternatives are available, and by using devices with safety features provided by the employer, and by avoiding recapping and by getting a hepatitis B vaccination if you haven't had one already. OSHA expects all employers who, whose employees are at risk due to their work condition and environment to have established protocols designed to eliminate or minimize the employee's exposure to bloodborne pathogens. TLC has those. OSHA has mandated annual training required for all employees with potential occupational exposure, thus this presentation being put on TLC Academy this year. The primary bloodborne pathogens are hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, 
and human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Hepatitis A appears only as an acute or newly occurring infection, and it does not become chronic. People with hepatitis A usually improve without treatment. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C can also begin as an acute infection. But in some people, the virus remains in the body, resulting in chronic disease and long-term liver problems. If a person has had one type of viral hepatitis in the past, it's still possible to get the other types. You don't become immune just because you have hepatitis A from hepatitis B and C. Of the three major bloodborne pathogens, hepatitis B virus is the most contagious. Hepatitis B virus can remain infectious outside the body for up to seven days. Mm. For your information, there are approximately 200 million people worldwide currently infected with hepatitis C virus. There are vaccines to prevent hepatitis A and B, however, there is not one yet for hepatitis C that is marketable. They're working on it. The best way to prevent hepatitis B viral infection is by getting vaccinated. Your employer should offer you or pay for a hepatitis B vaccination series as needed. Approximately 97% of people who receive the vaccine will become fully immune to the virus. You need not worry that you may contract hepatitis B infection from the two vaccines that are currently used in the United States. You will not contract the disease by getting the virus immunization. Almost every day, 5,500 individuals die from AIDS. That figure might even be higher at this point in time. Similar to hepatitis B and C viruses, it is important to understand that individuals with HIV are potentially infectious to others even though they may have no observable symptoms. HIV cannot reproduce outside the human body. Casual social contact, such as shaking hands, hugging or sharing telephones or tools, does not transmit blood-borne pathogens, unless the surfaces are blood contaminated, and there is direct access to the host through mucosal or dermal points of entry. If you have a small cut on your finger and you pick up a bloody object, you could potentially pick up one of these blood-borne diseases. The dermal requires some skin break integrity. Or I'll say that differently. The dermal contact requires some break in the skin's integrity is a better way to express that thought. Mm -hmm. So what are universal precautions? It's defined by the CDC, the uh, Central Disease Control, uh, as a set of precautions designed to prevent transmission of HIV, HBV, and other blood-borne pathogens when providing first aid or health care. Universal precautions apply to feces, nasal secretions, sputum, tears, urine, vomit, and blood. The one secretion that is not included is sweat, because there's no documentation that I know of that sweat puts a person at risk of transmitting pathogens. Ultimately, it's best to protect yourself from all body fluids, including sweat. Wearing gloves is probably the most important thing and washing your hands that you can ever do. You will have opportunities to use personal protective equipment known as PPE. PPE includes disposable gloves which are always available at TLC for any caregiver to pick up and put in their car or many times they will actually be in the client's home either by way of TLC or by way of the client and his family personally purchasing them. It's important for caregivers to recognize when the gloves are necessary. Um, even doing cleaning chores in a client's home, especially when you're doing it in their bathrooms, is a significant place for you to be wearing gloves. You wouldn't be necessarily wearing them when you're preparing food. 
as another alternative way to look at the use of these. PPE also includes gowns on some occasions if you're caring for someone where you might be exposed to contaminated fluids. In particular, these occur often in institutional settings. When you have someone who might be projectile vomiting or maybe coughing up sputum in um, copious amounts, protective face shields may be also worn. Um, and sometimes resuscitation masks or shields are kept available for caregivers in the event that they have to do CPR on someone who is contaminated. Your nursing uniform or scrubs or the general work clothes that home care providers might wear do not, I repeat, they do not constitute sufficient protection because as a rule you don't throw them away immediately after you're exposed. I know some caregivers who actually bring a change of clothes so that when they leave a client's home they immediately get out of their work clothes and their work shoes and they bring them home and launder them you know separately or among their own laundry but they they don't walk around wearing the same clothes after they leave a client's home. That's smart. Um, it's a challenge sometimes for our caregivers and I'll say this uh, openly that when you have more than one client and you have to move from one place to another uh, it is important to pay attention to whether or not your clients, any of them, have a transmittable disease. In those cases, you might have to take some extra steps to prevent transmitting the disease from one client to another or even from contaminating yourself. Mm -hmm. um, as a rule, when you go from one client to another who doesn't have a transmittable disease, then you use your common sense and you wash your hands well and you wear gloves. That typically would be the sufficient um, <clears throat> preventive measure that you need to take when you're walking from one client to another. And as you all know, one of the first things you should do when you walk in a new person's home or in a client's home, after greeting them with a smile and saying who you are, is ask permission to wash your hands immediately. Yeah. That is really important. TLC is required to ensure that its employees use and have available personal protective equipment when it's appropriate. And we will supply them to you as needed, including the gowns and the masks if they're necessary. It's the employee's responsibility to ask for these equipments when a need arises, even if it ha in case it hasn't been anticipated by TLC's management. So again, if you go to a client's home, and this has happened recently, where a caregiver went to a home that turned out to be excessively dirty and there was all kinds of body content that was about the house that shouldn't have been. The caregiver became very concerned that she might be exposed to something because um, rightly so. So she called TLC and requested that um, she be given some gowns to wear while she was cleaning in this person's home in addition to the gloves. She didn't wear her mask, she didn't feel she needed to do that, but she didn't want to get any of these bodily fluids or bodily excrements on her personal clothing. Makes sense. So that was a very astute thing for that caregiver to do. We provided them to her and she just took a bundle of them and had them with her in her car and every time she went to see that client, she was able to wear them. So that was a good, uh, a good action on her part. Um, one of your primary personal uh, protective equipments, tools, is the disposable glove. Gloves should be changed after contact with every client and your hands washed immediately after your gloves are removed whenever it's possible. Alcohol-based hand cleaner can be substituted once or twice between hand washings when soap and water are not immediately available, but they do not substitute fully for good proper hand washing of more than a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and you do not need to use an antimicrobial soap. That's, a, that's an old fashioned nonsense that doesn't have to take place. Any soap that will be causing you to repeatedly scrub your hands together to get the soap off and under running water, if you can, is the ideal way to clean your hands. It does not need to be antimicrobial. Um, and also um, 
remember you cannot reuse a pair of gloves. They are not reusable. They are disposable. They are not required to be worn, gloves that is, when you give a non-vascular injection where hand contact with blood is not reasonably expected. So if I give you an injection like a vaccine injection in your deltoid muscle, I don't have to be wearing gloves necessarily to do that because hmm. it's not expected that I'm going to be exposed to your blood unless I get stuck by the needle that went into your body. Mm -hmm. um, and wearing gloves at that point won't protect me from getting stuck. Yeah. So um, You just have to use your common sense about when and where. Mm -hmm. uh, so with all of that said, I leave you today, again, encouraging you to think, be patient, take your time when you're doing care, and remember that TLC would like to support you as needed with acquisition of your personal protective equipment when it's necessary, and we will, um, all, we will always make that available to you upon request. Um, and um, my audience has a question, so um, I would like to take that question and um, go with the content. Okay, uh, the question is, uh, you said that hepatitis B will stay alive for seven days. It, it's, it's still an active entity. On surfaces? Entity. Um, yes, if it's exposed to the outside, it's, it remains... It's, it's like MRSA. MRSA does the okay. same thing. Yes. MRSA yeah. can remain for a long period, even longer than seven days sometimes, exactly. uh, actively. You know, it, kind of, it goes dormant, mm -hmm. but if, it's, if, it, if it gets into someone's body, then it, it can... It would go dormant on the surface, but if you had a cut on your hand or yeah. on and your it skin... And it was whatever, restored it to a, a moist environment, it would reactivate. Very interesting. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very important. And even if it remains active on the surface, the point is it can stay alive exteriorly for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Very good information.